hi you guys welcome to my channel this is Kajin my life my journey so that means what my business <laughs> so anyhow you guys oh the lighting is horrible in here today so hold on let's see something it's a little better it's a little better <clears throat> Are my edges laid down? Are my edges laid? Okay, just trying to make sure. Now let me stop. <laughs> anyway, guys, um, so this is part two of um, rape stories. I want to show. I want to tell you about um, the very first time that it actually happened to me. But you still have four remaining secret voices left to choose from. And you can still win that $100,000 after the break. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, when I was nine years old, I was adopted. And a few of my other siblings who were adopted and we were moved from Mississippi to New York. And we went to live with a woman and her six children that she already had. Um, during that time <coughs> of me living there and growing up in that house, there's a lot of ups and downs as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, at the time, my foster mom, she worked really hard. She worked always, as far as I know, she's always worked two jobs. She's never just just settled for one job. Um, we always had a beautiful home. Um, everything that we wanted. Except for, in my opinion, her attention, her presence. Um, I felt like this needed a lot more in the household because she would have been able to stop a lot of things that were happening at the hands of her, at the time, her boyfriend. Um, and um, one of my, um, what, somebody else, one of my foster siblings, so it's not my blood sibling, it's a foster sibling. Um, I remember the first night, the very first night that he, that he molested me. Um, I remember so shocked. It was the first, it was, it was, you know, I'm laying in bed. Now I'm going backwards, kind of, you guys, and I'm mixing it up, and I shouldn't. I should have started from the very beginning when the, I very, the very first time I've ever been touched when I was a minor, when I was a child. Um, I'll start there before the sibling thing. That was when I was living in Mississippi. It was when my grandmother was alive. I remember. I remember my grandmother calling me in from playing outside because when the street lights go out, my grandmother was like, you know, that's when it's time to come inside. So, um, <clears throat> me and my sister, we ran inside. Um, we had to come from underneath the house because our house had these tall, it sat on these tall columns, you know. Um, and so it was enough space in there for little kids to go and play and play house and everything. So we used to go in there and play with our friends every day. And I was always the mom, of course. But even from a little kid, I was playing mother. <laughs> so... But I remember the very first time I remember being touched. I was a probably about six. Because it was so vague in my mind. Like if I, for many years as an adult, I pretended it didn't happen. Like I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember the face of the person. I knew there were two grown men. And when me and my sister ran up the staircase to go inside the house. We had to go past them. They were sitting on the porch in chairs and we had to like walk past them to get into our door. And 
I let my sister go in first. And then when I was about to go in behind her, one of the men grabbed my arm and pulled me back on the porch. And he said, listen, um, I got some. And I probably was like, I don't know, five or six. I was like five or six years old. Maybe six. Maybe five. I don't know. It was around that age, like five or six. But I remember. And I said to him, well, he said, I said, well, what are you doing? And he was like, I said, I got to go. I got to go. And he was like, I have some chocolate milk. One of my favorite drinks as a child was chocolate milk. I love chocolate milk. I couldn't get enough of chocolate milk. I, I don't drink milk anymore. But um, unless maybe if it's almond chocolate milk. That, but I used to love chocolate milk. Um, and he said to me, he has some milk, chocolate milk. And I don't remember who the man was. Like, I don't know who he was. And I don't remember the guy sitting next to him. I don't remember their faces. But I remember him grabbing my arm. My sister's in the house. He got my arm and he pulled out his dick. He put out his penis. And he said, if you put your mouth on this, um, there's some milk inside of it. Yeah. And I was probably about five when I remember doing it. Yep. Didn't know any better. I did it. Um, anyway. So I did it. And like within seconds, within like seconds, he started coming, started squirting. And I'm like, what is this nasty, sticky shit that's, you know, on my lip, on my mouth? It tasted disgusting. I remember throwing up on his shoes. And then I ran in the house because I knew it was something wrong. I didn't know what that was, but I knew it was something was wrong. That's all I knew at that age. <laughs> For many, many years, I suppressed it. For many, many years, I pretended that it did not happen. And the reason why is because as I got older, as a child, you start to, and then you start to grow older, and you start to realize, hear different things about sex and different things, and penises and vaginas, and then I felt like, oh, oh, okay, so what I did was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. That was bad. That was no good. That was bad. I'm not going to tell anybody that I did that because I'm going to get in trouble, you know? So for many, many years, even as an adult, I suppressed it. Um, but I remember in 1995, I went to counseling to because when you when you're making a transition, whether it's male to female, female to male, and you want to go on hormone therapy, you basically um, have to see a therapist. And you know how it goes. I mean, anybody who's watching who's, who's trans knows that you have to see a therapist and stuff. And so I had to see a therapist weekly um, about that. And um, one of the things that we talked about in therapy was my molestation. And if it wasn't for her, this woman, opening that door for me, I would have never thought about this happening to me again. Like, I had closed that door. I closed it. It was behind me. I never wanted to talk about it. I never even thought about it anymore. But she made me think of my childhood. And when I started thinking about my childhood, I thought about that. It came up in my memory. I had put it away so far for so long, I literally had forgotten it. So... I started crying, and she was asking me why I'm crying, and I kept telling her I don't know why, and then I finally just confessed that it was what had happened to me as a child. And I had never thought about it, you guys, because I, it, it was so ugly. You know, you, you feel so ashamed as a child. You take all of the weight for what a fucking grown ass fucking pedophile and as nasty ass motherfucker did to you. You taking all the blame for it. And that's wrong. I didn't know that at the time though. So um, as a young adult, her bringing that up to me um, stirred up all types of emotions for me. And so 
now I know better. I know that, you know, if you are raped and, um, it's, you know, you're, 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 you're the survivor, you're the victim. I don't like to say victim because if you survived, then you are a survivor. But you are the one who, you're not the one who was wrong. It was the asshole who did what they, what they did to you. Um, so, that's, that happened to me at like five years old. And I remember it. And then when I was adopted at nine years old, me and my sister had brought to New York to live with this woman who had um, six kids of her own. She had uh, five boys and one girl. And we grew up with them. So, um... We all became family, of course, because we all grew up as little children, little kids together. So we don't know anything else but each other outside of that. We don't know, you know, we're, we're family regardless. We're like blood regardless. So, long story short. Um, at the age of nine, from the moment I reached that house in New York, from Mississippi. Uh, one of my foster brothers, Bingo is like going crazy in my bingo thing. I don't know why, because I just logged on tonight. But anyway, um, a lot, a lot happened to me at nine. Um, I was introduced to the same type of crap again. This time it was from one of her children, her biological children, which was my foster brother. And every, almost every night, I would say at least twice a week for years, uh, for, for as long as he stayed in, not even for as long as he stayed in the house, because I'm going to tell you when it ended, um, but for about two weeks, for years, every two weeks, I mean, I'm sorry, twice every two, every week for years, he would... She'd have like a, a big room where all the boys were together at the time. And of course, when I was younger, I could not be the girl that I wanted to be. Even with the long hair, she cut all of that off. With the pierced earrings that I had that my biological family put in my hair, she took those out. <laughs> she tried to make me the boy she wanted me to be for so, so long. For so, and it, as you see, honey, it did not work. Um, but my point is, he should keep all of us in one room with like bunk beds or, you know, just beds very close together and stuff. And I would wake up, I remember the first time waking up to, um, somebody humping on me. Yes. This motherfucker was humping, literally humping on me, you guys. Um, I was so embarrassed. But check this out. This is where the this is where the the the, 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 the sickness is because I was embarrassed for him, not for me. I was embarrassed to let him know. I was worried about embarrassing him. If I open my eyes and let him see that I know that he's on top of me. So the whole time and every time after that, that he did it, I kept my eyes closed and pretended that I was asleep. That I didn't know that what he was doing to me. And he continued. Like I just played dead. I just played sleep. The whole time. Every time. Because I didn't want to embarrass him. I didn't want to like, open my eyes and he gets embarrassed and run off. Why would I feel like that though? I never understood that. Why am I embarrassed for this motherfucker? Why? Why am I trying to save his ass? Because I was so shocked. I was so shocked that he could do this. Like, who would do that? It's in my mind. This is an older kid. He's a teenager. I'm like, a li I'm little. I'm the only nine. So... That happened from the age of nine all the way into the age of 14. But you want to know something, you guys? 
because he started doing that to me, I started wetting in the bed. I didn't understand why are you wetting the bed, bitch, at 9 and 10 and 11. Like, why are you being in the bed on your side? And then I understood. I started doing research. I started talking to people. And I found out that kids that are molested, sexually abused, or abused physically in some type of way, that they, um, they, they, they uh, one of the signs is that, one of the signs from it is they will wet the bed at night, you know, um, and I was wet in the bed every night. That motherfucker would still get in the wet bed, take out my you-know-what, and put, put his mouth on it, wet, pissy, and all. That's how nasty he was. Vocal manipulation machine. So and I'm still like this. Yep. Pretending that it didn't happen. I did, I did that for years. I did that all the way to the age of 14. And what made me stop is that he and one of the, my other foster brothers had moved out of the house. They had moved out as young teenagers and moved in with their biological father. So they left home early. Um, but they moved to Brooklyn. So my foster mom would go to her husband's house to take the rest of us. Now, I never told her what was going on, but she would pack all of us in the car and drive. Well, the ones that wanted to go, which was me, Tia, oh, well, one of my sisters, <laughs> um, me and a couple of other siblings, and we would get in a car, and we would ride off to Brooklyn to be with my mother's husband, my foster mother's husband, and we would stay the weekend there. She would get us out of there and take us to Brooklyn. Um, he's got a good sense of humor. I never wanted to go, but she would kind of be forceful with it and make us go. I never wanted to go. I never wanted to go. Hell, I didn't even want to stay in Long Beach. I wanted to go to Freeport. I did not want to stay in Long Beach but, or Brooklyn. And she would make us go visit him. And I knew that I didn't get along with him. He didn't really like me. I didn't really like him. You know, my, 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 my mother's husband. My foster mother's husband. So, but, and, and then I had to be around the molester. Even worse. So, what ended up happening is the last time she took us there he was drunk he was drunk you guys he um I was asleep on the sofa ooh, 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 ooh. I'll tell you what it happened the last time it happened I was going to see, it was me, my little sister Tia, who came out there, and we went to see the ball fall, that's before it was the apple, before they changed it to the apple, it was the ball, it was this glittery ball, a ball with all these lights on it, that <coughs> would come down on New Year's, um, my older foster brother and his girlfriend took me and my younger sister down to New Year's Eve to see the ball fall. Now they were into all kinds of crazy stuff but we supposedly were going to see the ball fall. So okay excuse the sound of the TV in the background but I have a very nosy neighbor and so when I make these lives I try to make as much noise as possible so that way he can't hear it what I'm saying because he's a creep he's like a real he's mentally ill but he's not that mentally ill he's a, he's smart enough to try to listen in on my conversations he's a creep we'll talk about him another time um so we all went down there to the New Year's Eve party, and I ended up getting hit by a car. I got hit by a car. I got hit by a New York City taxi. The driver hit me. I was pinned between the taxi and a parked car. So, 
I'm screaming, my little baby sister's screaming, she's crying hysterically, like she crying more than I am, she's so scared and upset that this is happening to me, she don't know what to do, like I just wanted to get her home, I was more concerned about her because she was crying so hard, you know, she was so upset that that had happened to me, and she wanted us to go home. She kept saying, I want to go home. I said, okay, okay, I'm going to take you home. Come on. I would grab her hand, and I took her, and, and, and you know, my brother, he came. He Somebody got in the car from the from the crowd, jumped in the car, and barked back the car up off of my leg. And I was able to hobble on, on through to the rest of the, the other side of the street. Got on the subway train, rolled back to my foster mother's husband's apartment in Brooklyn. Now, we had no business down there. We weren't supposed to go. So I wasn't going to tell anything. But I, look, I mean, my knee is all fucked up now. Like, it was big as hell. So I'm laying on the sofa in the living room. And I'm in so much pain. And I'm hurting so bad. I'm trying to sleep. And I'm hoping that my leg gets better on its own. Because I'm thinking, oh my God, my mom is going to kill me. She, I know she didn't want us to go to the city. She's going to kill me. So... In walks my foster molester. Yep, while I'm sleeping. Foster brother, the molester. And he's drunk. And he climbs on the couch. I'm watching the whole thing because I'm in so much pain. I, there's no way I'm going to sleep. And he climbs on the couch. And he tries to hump me again. Like dry hump me. And as he's doing that, I can smell the liquor from his breath. I can smell everything. He just smelled disgusting. And then all of a sudden, he's like... Bleh. And when I seen he was about to throw up, I went... And I pushed him off of me. Like, bitch... This is the time I'm not going to pretend I'm asleep any fucking more. Fuck this. It's over. I'm done with this. And, and like, I'm not keeping your secret no more, bitch. And I pushed him down on the floor and he threw up and it's vomit right there on the floor and he fell in it and everything. So, he just laid there for a minute and then he finally got up and then my... My mom, my foster mom's husband walks in late in the morning, and he walks over to the sofa, and he notices my knee. He sees it. He sees it. He's like, what the fuck is wrong with your leg? And I was like, I went, I had to tell him I went to the thing, and I got hit by a car. He was like, no, we got to go to the hospital now. So he took me to the hospital, to the emergency room, and they had these needles that were about that long and the tubes were like that fat on them and they were about that long and it were big big needles big tubes and they kind of just fit thing and just draw it out they draw it out big two big tubes of blood that were that was in my knee or whatever and then they put a, um, a half a cast on me on my leg and i got sent home i went home um that was the last time I was molested by this fool. Yeah. So that's all. That's what happened, you guys. Um, I haven't told him yet, but I'm going to tell him. Before I leave this earth, he will know. I will let him know to his face what he did. He almost got it two years ago when he tried, he tried me. Um, he came up here to visit. And my aunt said, aren't you going to say hello to your sister? And he goes, shit, I ain't got no sister. There ain't no sister of mine because I had made my transition so he couldn't take it. But yet when I go outside of the house, you following me outside and in the car just sitting there staring at me outside like a dumbass. That was my moment actually to go over there and attack your ass. So what I said to him when I was walking out the fucking door and I said, bitch, let me explain something to you. I'm not the one you want to fucking play with. I, this ain't what you want. His father was with him. And he goes, who are you talking to me? I didn't know that. I said, no, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to that bitch ass, punk ass, faggot ass, pussy ass nigga that you're standing there with. Him. He know what I'm talking about. Because one kick, one karate, one kung fu kick, baby. And he would have been down the stairs.
I promise you. You must have weighed like 90 pounds. Just one Kung Fu kick. That's exactly what I wanted to do to him. But I let him live. But I'm still going to let him know. I'm going to let him know one day what he did. Um, yeah. So that happened. And that's the story, you guys. Yep. That is the story. So, um, I said this before. Um, is there anybody that out there that's listening? Um, I understand what you're going through because I went through it personally myself. Um, and if you need to talk, hit me up on Facebook. We can talk in Facebook Messenger. Um, it's KK Brassfield. So K A Y K A Y Brassfield B R A W S F I E L D K K Brassfield. Or Cajun's Outreach for the Homeless, and we can talk there in the Messenger as well. Um, because I'm about to start a support group for um, trans women, and I think I want to add trans men. Trans men and women I want to add to it. I think I want to, it's a support group slash group for domestic violence as well. So people who have been physically and sexually abused um, and feel like they are victims I don't want you to feel like you're a victim because you are a survivor, because you are strong, because you are worthy of a lot better than what happened to you. And I don't want what happened to you be defined who you are. It's not who you are. It's just something that happened to you. It doesn't make you. You understand me? You're strong, beautiful man and beautiful woman. Know that in here. So what we're going to do is we're going to start a support group so you guys can... And it's going to be private. So private, there will be no cisgender people in the group at all. At all. It will only, it will only consist of trans men and trans women. Um, for now. That's all. But it will never be cisgender people. Cis heterosexual people. It will never be that. It will always consist of just us. Um, no one else will be able to get it. Um, so... Give me time to figure out how to design the group, fill out what I need to fill out, make it private, and um, and get it going. But that's my other mission. I got so much on my plate. I got a lot of things on my plate. I have surgery on my mind, which is in December, which is like literally a month and a half away. And then I got um, my homeless for the outreach which I'm trying to do, which I'm going to try to do as much as I can up until I can't no longer go out there. Because remember, you know, a couple of weeks before surgery, I don't really want to be around people. I always stop like a month before going around doing stuff around people because I don't want to come up positive for corona or anything. I don't want to get no flu. Mm -mm. Gotta stay sick. So, I try to keep myself healthy until then. Um... So I'm going to be busy. I'm busy with that. I'm doing, I'm going to do the support group. Um, and I have the YouTube channel here, of course, to, um, you know, post my journey here for you guys to see. So I'm hoping that I'm helping, even I just help just one, peop, one person, you know. I want to help a lot more. But even if I just help one, if I, if I, if I'm helping one person out of a terrible situation, whether, whether it's through my outreach or whether it's here, um, by posting my journey and my life, then I feel blessed. I feel blessed. I love y'all. Keep watching and do me a favor and hit that like button right there and hit the subscribe button right there. Hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. I love you. Keep watching. Share the video, child. Share, share, share. <laughs> Tell your mama them and everybody about it. I love y'all.